Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Will Harold from the Rogue River in Oregon with the Walter Russell Secret of Light group. Today, we're going to change a bit. Um, we are going to actually discuss biogeometry today. This is through the Akashic Intelligence, the original AI uh, that we're going to put this up on YouTube. And we are going to discuss energies and the energies that um, are from the wave that Walter Russell talks about. Uh, Bear Lando encouraged me to actually study Walter Russell because of our uh, shared interest in biogeometry. And he said that along with using the tools of biogeometry, that it would be very, very important to understand actually the wave form mechanics that were behind um, the actual science of how biogeometry worked. <clears throat> One thing that I'm finding that as I speak to people, and again, you know, this is all very new, and for a lot of people it's called woo-woo or, you know, out there. But you can actually talk to anybody that, from what I've found, that has a spiritual bent, and even, say, with my own family, who are Christian-based and believe in things like the Holy Spirit, believe in miracles, believe in things that can happen, but could often be like associated with magic or woo or what you want to call it. But once you say, if they do have that spiritual base and they do know that spirit can work and move, what you're really doing, you're just saying, well, all I'm doing within biogeometry or waveform mechanics is explaining how the spirit is trans muted or you know transformed down from the heavens into the 3d and what are the mechanics that make that work within the within the 3d plane which is the waveform mechanic so what we have then is you know as above so below uh the spirit coming down being manifest so we have the spiritual and the science so now it's a spiritual science which is also talked about by um uh, Steiner and so on. So the idea of the spiritual science is really what Steiner said was going to be the new way going forward for mankind as we uh, change into the new consciousness. And we're no longer just going to be based on a belief system, but on a belief that there is a higher power, but that that does have a, a scientific explanation in the 3D. So with that being said, I um, want to look at the, the Vesica Institute which is uh, Dr. Robert Gilbert. He has a great site, lots of really good um, information and courses you can take through him. He is one of the only sanctioned teachers by Ibrahim Karim in the United States to teach the courses. Um, I took the courses from uh, Robert in person in Palo Alto uh, three years ago. Um, so that was really, because now mostly everything's online and because of what's going on, they're not really giving a lot of uh, classes in person. But I did, it was a, I took, basically the study for biogeometry is, uh, what I took was a two week course, the first work being the basics in biogeometry and the second week being the advanced topics of biogeometry. And in the first class, you're basically learning the basics of biogeometry, some pendulum work. But then you actually move into the advanced topics, and this is what we're going to talk about today is actually an advanced topic called the archetypal ruler. And so within the archetypal ruler, uh, I'm just going to read through this a bit so we can, since the people, some people like to listen to the podcast, you know, or these things, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and so if they are listening, they're not seeing. So we are only just beginning to decode and reclaim the advanced vibrational science used in the ancient Egyptian temples. Some of the most important Modern rediscoveries have been made by the Egyptian architect and natural scientist Dr. Ibrahim Karim, founder of modern biogeometry. So, if people aren't aware, Dr. Karim is Egyptian and his family um, has a uh, history and is very well connected to the um, archaeology of Egypt. So, they did a lot of work with. Egyptology and you know his Egyptology is different than say the British Egyptology of that these are all tombs and that kind of thing that which is really comes from the you know 1900s and from Napoleon and so on that was really has been propagated as um, Egyptology but may not really encompass or doesn't encompass uh, what 
some people believe was truly going on with the Egyptian mysteries. So Ibrahim Karim comes from that background from Egypt. He wanted to be an architect. He went to Switzerland and uh, studied at uh, at the Swiss Academy, where he learned uh, land, where he learned planning and design and architecture. So his background became very based in architecture and structure and design and how to put things together. Uh, from that, he began to study radiesthesia, which is the use of a pendulum and a form and a shape. And so, you know, we've talked about this in the past, but this, if people can see this, right, is a pendulum that is used, and this is called the Wodge pendulum. But as you can see, all these different, all these different shapes uh, constitute the different planes of nature. So that, again, the disc is a mental plane, and the hemispheres and spheres and um, points are all different things of uh, the etheric, the vital, the astral, and the spiritual planes of nature. And so what is happening with this is these different shapes are actually interacting with the waveform through, through your body, through your DNA, and so on, and picking up those waves. Now, this differs from, say, like a neutral pendulum or something where you're doing a mental dowsing, like, say, where you use what this is called, just the neutral pendulum, which is very powerful in itself. But you usually with this, you do what they would call a mental dowsing. So you're asking, like, yes and no questions of the pendulum. And that's why it's called mental dowsing, because it's going to give you a yes or no answer. It's going to, it's going to, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to spin. In a direction. So with the biogeometry, you're going to get the count, the clockwise spin once you begin to pick up certain energies. And one of the main energies within biogeometry is this pendulum here, which is called the BG3 pendulum. And what the BG3 pendulum is, is BG just stands for biogeometry. And three is the three major energies that they found um, within sacred spots and also within Coptic Christian saints' tombs, which is one which is called the higher harmonic of gold, which oftentimes when you see in like Byzantine paintings and things where they have the gold, you know, halo around saints or whatever, that's that higher harmonic of gold. And then you also have ultraviolet, which is kind of the spiritual realm. So within the it's believed that in angelic forms and things will actually um, materialize within the ultraviolet spectrum. And then you would have what he would call uh, negative green. A negative green is kind of the life force. And that life force of that negative green, um, I've had some conversations with Bear because as you talk about orgone and prana and chi and all these different names, uh, which come from different traditions or different courses of study, my question was, is it really all the same? You know, are we all talking about the same energy just with different words based on our systems that we're in? And he said, yeah, he you know, kind of thought it was all the same. So as we begin to talk about um, these energies and how oh, they're... Sure. Sam, Sam, can you, can you mute? Oh, sorry. Um, as we talk about these energies, we also can begin to relate other forms, other systems, and so on to how they all relate and interact uh, with this life-giving force, right? This this chi, prana, BG3, and so on. And so we can now be, begin to tie, instead of having differences in theories or, or structures, we begin to see the similarities. And then we can actually begin to draw some synergies between those that become much more powerful as we combine the different modalities and um, to create even a much stronger science and system. So that is B, so everybody understand what BG3 is? Or is there any questions about BG3? All right, okay. The other thing about BG3, now, yet, for those who are flat earthers, they may not agree with this definition of BG3, but within um, Ibrahim Karim's cosmology and ideas is that BG3 is also the energy that's being put off by, as the earth, sh as the sun shines on the earth, you have the sunny side, you have the dark side, right? 
So as the sun hits the earth, as it goes through the earth, it comes back to the backside. And on the backside where it's dark and where most people sleep at night, that is where BG3 is also being generated. So as the sun comes into the earth, is filtered by the earth, and goes to the dark side, that's also the negative green on that side. So that's the regenerative power. So at night where we're sleeping, that's we're actually getting an additional energy boost from the sun, but in the BG3 spectrum. Okay, so let's go back and read a little bit more here. Let's go back to up on the screen. So among Dr. Kareem's many discoveries, the fact that ancient Egyptian temples knew and used a key energy blueprint, a special geometric grid, which held enclosed information about every level of the spiritual energies and powers inside every human being. The Egyptian priests built this platform invisibly into the major illustrations on their temple walls, as well as into statues, some of them quite massive, built during ancient times. And here's a few facts about the human archetypal grid, which Dr. Kareem discovered. The grid has 19 levels, connects it in resonance to the spiritual blueprint of every human being. So this is a grid that is like the life grid that the Egyptians kind of discovered that has these 19 levels. And so this grid, you can overlay the human body on it, and you can actually have these points which will show the energetic properties of the body that tie back to what he calls archetypes. And they're a little bit different archetypes than what Plato or um, you know Jung may discuss. They're similar, but actually what... Uh, Ibrahim Karim calls them as netters. And so the netters are like um, the base spiritual elementals. And so those would be the archetypal pure types of energy in which are expressed on the archetypal ruler. So you can, even though it's the same word, archetype, meaning this kind of primary, um, pure, basic concept, it's a little bit different than the Platonic or the uh, Jungian idea of archetype. So, so the grid includes both uh, major and minor energy points in the human body, each which has different powers embedded within them. This is, again gets back to these netters and the idea of the archetype. The grid activates an energetic field inside and around the pictures. Again, Within biogeometry, and this is actually, you know, hermeticism or whatever, is that you're saying as above, so below. So if I draw an image of something, I can actually capture its energy signature. By actually just drawing an eyeball or a heart or other things, I can actually capture its energy signature. So it's kind of as above, so below. So through the image and through my intent, I can actually begin to capture energetic levels and energetic signatures. So the grid activates an energetic field inside and around the pictures and statues created within this code. These have energetic qualities similar to a human saint in prayer, which can be directly tested and confirmed by biogeometry methods. So again, we get back to the statement here, which is we're capturing energetic qualities. And this was a very big concept within our secret of light within Russell, as you guys know, that energy can have two components. One is quantity, which is like how intense the power is, right? And then you can have a quality. So it's like with red, it's like, is this more red or less red or, or you know, that's really kind of like the, the energetic, level, the, qu the quantity, right? The quality is what does that color produce in terms of the aesthetics, right? So we have a rose, right? What is the quality of a rose, right? The quantity, we can weigh the what rose, we can you know, check its mass, but what is the quality of the rose, right? You know, as Shakespeare said, if a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? It's because you're actually taking that quality of that rose. What is, how does that rose affect the quality of our lives? How, what are the qualities that can't be measured? Can you measure love? Oh, my love's more intense, you know, it's greater, you know, well, how do you measure that, right? But there is this quality to love 
that can't be measured, they can't be tangible. And so the only way that we can actually, from within biogeometry, measure qualities is through biogeometry and waveform. And so these tools are what actually help measure those qualities. So again, it gets back to the kind of like this BG3 is like a, a, a saint. So a very pure, you know, um, well-intentioned type person who's in prayer. What are they emitting? What is that energy signature? I think, you know, we talked a little bit about last week where I was in the ocean trying to release elementals from the ocean. And somebody walked by and, you know, said, what are you doing? What are you doing out there? You know, and I said, Well, releasing elementals. You know, I said, There's a huge just energy around you when you're doing that. And they were drawn to go over and stand by me. And I was just standing there looking at the ocean, you know, doing this practice through Steiner. Um, so as we get into these different states of consciousness, it can actually be picked, be picked up by other people who, and she was a Reiki practitioner. So she was very familiar with these energy levels. So we, I do believe that we can emit you know, um, these higher levels of resonance of gold, harmonics, and so on through spiritual practice. Um, the grid can be used to activate the complete spiritual energy grid within any human being or to activate any specific center within the human being. So it can do the overall or it can just do specific centers based on what you really want to do within this archetypal ruler. The grid can be adapted to test the energy quality and quantity within any person, place, or thing. The grid can be used as a powerful energy balance device, which can affect any space it, it, it is activated in. The grid is related to the heka, sounds of power used by Egyptian priests, which can activate energy centers within the human body. So, you know, sound is vibrational, right? So we can activate also through sound. And this is one thing that I think that was we talked to Bear yesterday, he was actually very excited and looking forward to working with sound and creating sound studios because he actually sees that as a very strong modality that he would like to incorporate into Alphabetic and, and teach. Um, I forget what the uh, gal's name is that he interviews, but... Uh, He's be, is going to work with her quite a bit on really, you know, beginning to use sound within therapies also. So modern Egyptologists are aware of this 19 level uh, design grid used in ancient Egypt, but have no knowledge of its significance. So it's like they're aware that there was this component within these hieroglyphs or within these drawings within the temples, but they don't know why they're there. And it kind of gets back to, you know, you really have to, I think, begin to understand what the Egyptians were trying to accomplish, you know, very ancient civilization and so on. And what was their technology? Was, is there a technology that is different than ours that is based on, you know, what they use, which was form, number, grid, you know, all these things that um, we've now forgotten? And or uh, put aside because um, we it was lost and you know who knows why it was lost you know oftentimes when people begin to have certain you know secrets or whatever uh, they want the power of it so they keep it keep it more and more and more secret and finally it gets lost right because we no longer um, it's no longer taught or so on so the use of the grid on Egyptian temple walls within the flat grid of 19 levels. The Egyptian priests preserved the design code of the human body in the way that people were depicted on the temple walls. This required simplifying a 3D pattern of energy points inside the body into a 2D pattern. To be able to preserve the 3D form information when reduced to a 2D projection on a flat wall, certain postures of the body were necessary for the figures on the walls. These are the famous postures, artistic styles we know from the ancient Egyptian art. For example, it is necessary for the majority of the body to be presented forward and flat in the picture so that code information is not lost by an oblique perspective. This technique results in the image we are familiar with from ancient Egypt figures. 
looking toward one end of the picture, but with their shoulders square to the view and feet turned fully to the side. The grid of the 19th level is unique to ancient Egypt because they made the cornerstone of their design the spiritual archetype level of all things. Other types of grids were used for design in other cultures. For instance, the Greeks used a grid based on the physical level and the human head, resulting in a grid based on seven or other numbers. So I don't, uh, within my architecture studies, you know, I had to do a lot of art history and so on. And so when you look back on like these type of drawings, these flat, it's like, well, they didn't have the ability to draw correctly, right? They didn't have the ability to draw in perspective or they didn't have the ability. But, you know, at the same time, they're doing statues, right, um, that were 3D. So why are they drawn in this 2D fashion, right? Why are they drawn with these very rudimentary type drawings? It's because they didn't even understand why they were drawing. You know, people were just looking at the art as aesthetic. They weren't looking at it for inequality above why the drawing was being drawn that way. So a lot of these figures that were seen done with the feet in these certain directions and the shoulders squared and so on was very intentional to capture the energetic and spiritual bodies. So these hieroglyphs were actually far more superior in spiritual quality and technology than anything that would be more realistic or lifelike. It wasn't just trying to capture what we could see in the physical. It was actually trying to use the human form with a grid pattern to capture the energetic levels and to then be able to do technologies on the body and on our physical existence that would work in a greater way. And then we know, so that was the Egyptian use of grid and so on. And, and, and then later on, we have the Greeks that are doing the golden mean and all these other types of things later, which have the same ideas of sacred geometry, but aren't truly based on the Egyptian patterns. Any questions so far on what we've talked about with the grid and the archetypal and what the Egyptians were doing? Okay. I can just imagine when they go in those rooms in those times, um, it would have an effect eh, on, on our body. You know what I mean? On their body. Mm -hmm. And those priests or the people that are in there, the temple. Yeah. I mean, if they were told a little bit, then they would know. You know what I mean? Like they must have felt quite a, well, I'll say an energy rush or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and this was like, you know, the way of life, right? Everybody understood this. Everybody knew this. And it wasn't like what it is today where people can't even really comprehend a lot of this, right? As that, that, that there is this significance between as above, so below that images can capture, you know, um, the actual essence of something. And we're going to talk about that as we get into the ruler a bit more. So the living statues of ancient Egypt, when this grid was used to create statues in ancient Egypt and the statues were erected on sacred power spots, which radiate specific vibrational qualities. Then the statues would radiate harmony and resonate with the human spiritual archetype through the area. This kind of archetypal statue connects the original spiritual law with humanity. The energy of these statues is alive, like a living person in prayer. Huge statues of this kind placed on power spots in ancient e Egypt had tremendous power. When the knowledge of how to create this archetypal code statues was lost, statues became graven, graven images with no internal life or function, no resonance with higher power. So what they're actually doing is they're setting up human cell towers, right? I mean, they're setting up sacred cell towers that are putting off a resonance that is affecting the entire area and these statues become alive. And in some instances, this is like where you get into these oracles or these statues that actually would appear to talk and speak and that would actually take on human qualities. And so what you do if, if people aren't aware that what a sacred power spot is, oftentimes they're called ley lines and where these ley lines cross, they um, have actually a vortex. So a spiritual vortex is created. So all these great structures of the world uh, the pyramids, the uh, Stonehenge, uh, the Vatican, you know, uh, 
Mecca, all these things, the Dome of the Rock, you know, the Temple Mount, these are all on sacred power spots. And actually where, you know, most of the ancient spiritual centers, every church, they used to have uh, priests that would go around and actually find these sacred power spots, and that's where they would build the church, you know. And as other civilizations would come in, they would build their same sacred buildings over the old sacred buildings. And some people say, oh, well, they were just trying to show dominance over the society by, you know, knocking down the old structure and putting theirs up. But really, that was a spot that the, that the temple or the place of spiritual awakening would be. So that's where they actually put these, these uh, sacred power spots and sacred buildings. And then they would actually have a resonance that would come from that. So you were getting this constant resonance of actually the earth, right? The Schumann or whatever is going through these ley lines in the earth, also permeating these statues. So these became beacons of spiritual energy throughout the planet and now those have all been a lot of those were taken down and moved to england once you know egypt was conquered and so on and moved all around the world and even moved to washington dc uh and placed some of the obelisks from egypt were placed you know so they were actually taking a lot of that you know those structures and putting them on power spots uh, in new areas to actually get, gain that resonance and the, i think you know i've talked about also the miracle of Himberg, which is uh, kind of one of uh, Ibrahim Karim's landmark uh, efforts in which there was a town in Switzerland called Himberg that all the people were getting divorced, all the animals, the domesticated animals were getting tumors, all the natural animals were leaving, the uh, crops were failing. And what they had done was they had put a Swiss telecom cell tower within the church steeple so they had taken that uh technology of the of cellular you know which is detrimental placed it in the church steeple which was because it was the highest thing on the in the town but also they could hide it within the steeple right um but then what they were doing is they were taking the power from that sacred power spot and amplifying it so they were take so they were amplifying that negative energy and also they were cutting off whatever positive energy was being you know presented before it right within that sacred power spot within the the structure of that church so they, they changed the entire energetic field of that town so what abraham kareem did was he went in and he actually used biogeometry methods um to what we would call transmute the energy levels of that cell tower so within biogeometry, the concept of transmutation of energy, which is actually taking detrimental energy and um, either adding additional, um, you know, BG3 or these different harmonics to make that waveform actually either neutralized or transmuted into a beneficial wave pattern. And after he did his biogeometry to the cell tower, the cell tower still stayed, but everybody in the town said that they now had much better relationships with their family. The animals stopped having the tumors and natural animals came back in the trop and they had a much better yield and so on on their plants and crops. And if you go on to YouTube and look under the miracle of Hemberg, H-E-M-B-E-R-G, you can find some articles from Reuters on that actual um, event. Any questions so far on the resonance and power spots and any of that that I've talked about to date. Any questions? All right. So the use of the Egyptian human archetypal grid in modern biogeometry. So doc, so as you see here, this is kind of what I'm going to. Sh you can see it over um, here too. I have it laid out here, but this is the archetypal ruler. Okay. And so within the archetypal ruler, here's here's the grid that we're talking about that we have lined out. And then with, on these are these spots, which are the archetypal uh, power spots that we've talked about. And each of these will have a resonance based on where it appears in the grid. This area here, you can either place your thumb or you can uh, place a DNA sample. And that's just kind of where you get back to the idea of voodoo. And the idea of voodoo is, it's also what you, what, uh, can be called quantum entanglement. 
if anybody knows what quantum entanglement is, the idea of quantum entanglement is a uh, idea that was put forth by Einstein, which is also called uh, spooky behavior at a distance. And that's where the spooky two and so on uh, Rife machines get their name of spooky two is the spooky behavior at a distance. And the idea is if I have a fingernail or something, I can cut my nail. Within that nail of my my fingernail is the D, my DNA. And that DNA never actually separates from my body, even though I have removed it and moved it to a different location. There's still an entanglement between that fingernail that's cut and the fingernail that's in my body and my body itself, because it is my DNA signature, right? That's unique. And so the idea is that whatever I do to that fingernail will actually have an effect on the rest of my body because it is entangled through quantum entanglement. So it's kind of a scientific explanation for how voodoo works because within voodoo you take hair or different things, right? And you make a doll out of and you do things to that doll. So the idea is that, you know, through what you're doing through intent on that doll, you're actually actually using quantum entanglement to affect something back on the body from which it came from. So there is like a scientific explanation to the concept of the voodoo, right? And so within this, that same concept of DNA, quantum entanglement, you can what you do with that on the ruler can be transmuted at a distance to somebody else or to an area, okay? So any questions on that, on quantum entanglement and, and DNA and any thoughts on that or anything? So uh, I did, uh, well, we did a bio tuning session mm -hmm. a while back. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to get my head around, like she's using these tuning forks mm -hmm. and being able to work on us from remotely all the way from New Zealand in, mm -hmm. in this case. So I guess um, that's a way to do it using what you yeah. talked about blood here or yeah. but or using that's like quantum entanglement like you know it's got to do what with, with if you're doing bio if you're doing biofield tuning at a distance that's really more like reiki so it's intent so you're actually trying yeah. you're vi through visualization and it, it's almost like remote viewing right to where you're actually placing yourself next to the body i would say that this would be much more specific okay to, to where the tuning would be more energetic field overall with this, you can get actually drilled down much because you have a much better sample. If you understand what I'm saying, right? You actually have a physical sample that you're dealing with. So you can get- That why then uh, the, the Biggleson, mm -hmm. they work with the blood? Exactly. I mean, the, 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 the better sample you have, right? The better information you can, can garner, right? So um, if you get into the blood or you get into the DNA or you get into certain things, um, and I'm going to go over a little bit of how we can use DNA within the archetypal ruler when I get into actually showing that. Any more questions before I move on? All right. So Dr. Kareem has integrated his discovery of the human archetypal grid into practical training methods. In the biogeometry foundational training, students learn to directly test different energy qualities and methods to create highly beneficial energies. One of the many methods taught at the level is the use of specific number qualities in design. And I talked a little bit about that, I think, before class about, you know, using number of stones and things around trees and how important that was to, you know, based on sacred geometry and numbers for what you want to accomplish. Um, so we can uh, number of qualities in design because of the powerful and profound energy which the proper use of a 19 grid creates. We tend to use this number of vibrational qualities for designing spiritual locations and not for locations for more general use or for the general public. In the biogeometry advanced training, students are taught how to use a special energy measurement device on the human archetypal grid, what Dr. Kareem calls the human archetypal ruler or BG3 ruler, number name for the biogeometry human archetypal ruler, as BG3 is energy which balances and centers all living energy systems. And we talked a bit about that of what those three harmonics were. Again, I'll just repeat it. It is negative green, the higher harmonica gold, 
and ultraviolet are the three BG qualities for which we're talking about here for the energy, living energy systems. This amazing tool allows biogeography practitioners to directly test any living human, animal, or plant, any location, and even inanimate objects for their vibrational qualities and quantity. With a special attachment that has shapes connected to the different planes of nature, practitioners can test on any plane level of the energy system, physical, physical, vital, uh, vitality, emotional, mental, causal, spiritual, or divine. And so within this, within these nine, we will we can put these different planes of existence here, or planes of nature, to actually test where your blockage would be with it if you once we find out within the archetypal pattern, we can then drill down into the plane of nature in which this is happening. So this would get back with say within the ideas of German new medicine and so on, because where that's being manifest, where that issue is being manifested, um, is different. It, you know, and oftentimes we may just look in the physical plane, like you know, we may just look at the chemical process. Well, you have an imbalance, you have a hormone imbalance, whatever. That's really looking like at the, just the physical plane, right? But then you can say, oh, in German new medicine, oh, well, German new medicine, we're going to look, you know, within the emotional plane. Right, we're going to see that there's a trauma, even like within biofield tuning, you're looking at a trauma, right? You're looking at maybe something within the emotional body or within the actual vital body, even which would the vital body would be more considered, I guess, the subconscious body, um, where we're looking at like uh, the auto autonomic responses of breathing and heartbeat and things like that that we don't control, right? But then you get into the mental plane. So how much is my mental, you know, this gets back into um, Russell and even into, you know, German New Medicine. How much are my thoughts affecting my health, right? How much are those affect, you know, I can take all the supplements I want, but if my mind's not right, those supplements may not help because I'm having, my mind is overriding so much of what my body's doing. So that issue may be in my mental plane. And then you have the causal plane above that, and then you get into the spiritual plane. It could be a spiritual thing, you know. So this will just identify in which natural nature plane of nature your issue may be being derived. So, so you may change your focus of your modality based upon what plane the issue may be originating in. Any questions on that at this point? Can I have a sort of related question? Yes. Um, what do you mean by negative green? Is that another color? Well, it's not, it's within, I, I think it, if you, have you read much of The Secret of Light where we get into Russell and he gets into how the colors relate to the tones, how they relate to the gases? I haven't got to that part yet. I only just got the book recently. Yeah. So. so so within within Russ, you know Russell's cosmology, right? You would have on both ends of a spectrum, you would have red and blue, right? And this is what if you ever listen to Santos, it's a red shift, blue shift, and so on, right? Within the middle, you have a yellow, but within those bands, you have this whole um, this whole array of colors, right? And so within that shift, so the, the negative green is really think of it as on a vibrational frequency, not so much as the color itself, but as mm -hmm. the vibrational quality that's being emitted from that color. Right. So it's a quality. So it's not like just because you paint something green doesn't mean it's going to have a negative green quality. Right. It, so it's, it's not got it's so, so it's not like an inverse effect of um, of green. It's not like that. No. no. No, it's it'd be the vibrational quality and the way that they're um, describing the quality is through the color spectrum, rather than saying, you know, this is a 76 hertz wave or something like that, right? With this resonance and this carrier, it's easier to say that it's a negative green quality. That's what we're going to call this, right? And and so even like I said, within the ultraviolet spectrum and thing, they're actually saying these are some of the ideas or the higher harmonic of gold negative green is a little bit different. It's just really this whole thing of the regenerative power of the wave. 
So within the negative mm -hmm. green, that would be, like I said, that would relate to prana or chi or some of those other things. And then there'd be the minor qualities of beneficial energies with these other colors and spectrums. Thank you. Does that help? Thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, any any other questions before we move on to this the, the last part here? Okay, so we've talked a bit about the ruler. We've talked about the the, the, net, the planes of nature, and so the three grid system: male, female, and archetypal and human. So Dr. Kareem found that there were two different grid patterns in the human beings shown on the temple walls and statues: one for men and one for women. Dr. Kareem then found the points common to both men and women to arrive at the non-gender universal human archetypal pattern. It is in this pattern which Dr. Kareem has made available through the human archetypal pendant and the BG3 ruler. So some people have this pendant and it, they, it's sold on, the, on Dr. Kareem's biogeometry.com website. If you want to buy a pendant, you can actually put the pendant on. And then so wearing the Egyptian grid pattern on the human body, the human archetypal pattern on the BG3 ruler is the same as on the human archetypal pendant. However, because the human archetype pendant has been designed by Kareem to be worn directly on the body, some of the points in the full archetypal pattern were taken out to reduce the intensity of the pendant to a level where most people are comfortable with it. The pattern on the BGT ruler is the complete pattern. Note that the Vesica Institute imports both the human archetypal pendant and the BGT ruler from Egypt. The pendant is available for sale to everyone as it requires no training. One simply wears it as one would any pendant. The BGT ruler is, ruler is available to students in the advanced biogeometry training, where they are taught how to measure energetic fields accurately with this tool and to use it as an energetic tool in its own right. So a lot of the, the tools I'll be showing today, you actually have to take the training in order to purchase them. And that's kind of, and you can take those courses either through Vesica or through biogeometry.com or through, it really depends on, on how you want to take the courses in order to actually buy some of the advanced tools within um, uh, biogeometry. Any questions so far as some of the things I've covered? Is there any um, any question you have? Be free to. I mean, don't think that you know it's a stupid question or whatever. All questions are good and may help other people that are having the same thoughts. For me, <clears throat> this is just all new stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, I I'm not absorbing it enough to ask a cogent question. <laughs> okay, that's that's fair. When you were covering, um, well, I think you, well, you might have mentioned rose there at some point, mm -hmm. like a, a, the flower, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have at home uh, a rose petal water from uh, Edgar Casey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a potential. I don't have the bottle here. I'm not using the right words, but there's a, there's a way there mm -hmm. generating whatever, you know, and so when you spray it on, it's like a lift. I don't know how to describe it. So kind of get it kind of gets to what you were saying about the energies of things, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know lots of people like rose petals. Imagine the people that put that in the bath or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something to it, eh? <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. with that, you know, the idea that all things have energetic signatures, and so what the biogeometry is, is really ways to measure that because it's very difficult if you don't have some type of metric, right? In which you can actually say, is the treatment effective? Is, you know, how do we know these things? And so, and even with the, you know, with the biogeometry pendulums, I mean, they're, they're kind of inexact because you're, the person using them, you know, has to hold them and they spin and you know, it, it can be, you know, very kind of woo woo or hey, you're spinning the pendulum and so on and so forth. But if you actually watch it in person, the spin of the pendulum is not and it's very difficult to get a a spin on something at a very it's easier to get something spinning wide. It's very hard to get something to spin at a very narrow band on a string. I mean you, you just it's just almost impossible to do it if you even try. So when you start seeing the pendulum move on that very small level, 
it's very difficult to get that with a string and something on the end of that. It's much easier if you want to really get it going and getting a big wide arc going, then that's easier to do. But to do it on a very small level is, is I think, impossible, actually. So we're now going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how these human archetypal rulers used and um, what is happening with that. I don't know if I can just isolate this one or not. Spotlight for everyone. Okay, is that is the archetypal ruler being spotlighted for everyone there? Can they see that? Can we zoom in a bit. N no, is that Grant's <laughs> camera? We're on G. Grant. Yeah, right here we're on G. Can we see? One G, eh? Yeah. Like we're, it's very small because we are seeing the. Um, I mean, yeah, we're I'm seeing. Gonna, I'm gonna stop screen sharing screen. my screen. Okay, stop share. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh wow. <laughs> can, can you see that now? Yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'm, I'm going to turn it the other way because I think it's probably better to view it in this angle here. And I have it on the blue because hopefully, because what it is, it's just a clear acrylic um, board here. Can people see this? Is it too? Okay. And so what we have here, if people can see, this is a little ring that's right here. Okay. I'll turn it off. Can I turn that off? Turn that off. Let's see if we can get it. It's, is, can you see it better now? Yes, it's better now. Okay, so you, can you see the circle right here? Yes. So within that circle, what we put there, if you guys can see this, okay. Yeah. It's, all you need is a piece of paper where someone rubs their DNA from their forehead, and that DNA gets on this paper, okay? So this is now the voodoo strip. But what you want, I don't know if you can see this or not, but you want that to be signed by the person okay. that who gets the DNA because that actually makes it personal. It gives you, you're giving, they're giving you your permission, their permission to actually do this. You don't want to do these kind of things without the other person's permission. So that's a little bit different from doing the voodoo in this, right? Voodoo, you're kind of doing it, you know, incognito, right? You're doing it without their permission. This, you're gaining their permission, so actually you're saying, you know, I'm here to help you, and so on and so forth. So I have an image here that might be a little bit graphic for somebody. It's not meant to be, but we were working on somebody's um, solar plex area, and so we actually did a picture of that area, right, with the breast and the belly and so on, and that would go next on the, on the ruler. So what you're now doing is you're taking their DNA and you're – creating an image of the area that you want to work in okay and so that's being brought from above to below so you're actually manifesting that body and that area in you know a realm within an energetic realm and you're capturing that on the archetypal ruler so as you saw with the other one you know back on the picture where they actually had the picture drawn of the egyptian on the archetypal ruler you're actually now taking the ruler and imprinting it on this body. So you're, you're bringing that energetic quality onto the ruler. Any questions on what I've talked to at this point? All right. And then what you do, next thing that you would do is you would take the BG3 pendulum here. Can we see the BG3 pendulum? Right here, the one we're this pendulum here. So this would be the BG3 qualities. And what you want to do when you use a radiesthesia, I have my shoes off. But I probably should stand up. And it, your posture and everything has a lot to do, but I can't really get into it here that much. But when you have a pendulum, what you want to do is you want to put the string around one of your fingers just so it's easier to hold. You can see that's just around one of my fingers, right? But then you want to do what they call a bird's beak pinch so you're kind of you're kind of like you know how you make the duck you know in shadow <laughs> you know like this that's how you want to kind of grab the pendulum as you hold it so what you're right now what i am i'm a conductor it's being the energy is being brought through me through my dna to the pendulum and i'm not asking the pendulum any questions okay i'm just trying to pick up the resonant qualities uh vibrational qualities and I would go over each of the dots and so what you what you do see is it begins to spin here 
what that means is that that area that dot is healthy right and you move to each dot and you try to find a dot that's not moving So, so it looks like this this is the area here that's not moving. See, the pendulum's not spinning. So that's where you would have that blockage for that area in that body for that person. And the next thing that you would need to do is you would get this thing. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but hopefully you can. This is actually the, the, the nine planes of existence. So each of these symbols on here represent a plane. Now there's more than nine on here because we have additional um, areas for the mental plane. Because from what Abraham Kareem and even I have seen mostly, even though not so much recently, but uh, usually I see more issues in the mental plane. And you have to really kind of drill down into the mental plane as to what area. But, you know, when you get the archetypal ruler, he actually will give you these other, you know, more exact things of like, you know, the kidneys, gallbladders, and so on that you would actually put in this area instead of the drawing that I did. You know, so you could actually put like the brain, the heart, the kidney, or so on. To actually concentrate on those areas and they're already done for you if you put instead of a, an image of a body part or an organ or whatever here if you put the humunculus which is like a, a drawing of the entire body you know like a human form then it would break this whole thing down into the chakras only and you would just be working on the chakras rather than the specific body part so if you just reduce that image down to the entire human body, you're now working on the chakras. Any questions so far as to the what we're doing, where we're trying to go, and what we're trying to accomplish now as we get into the planes of nature? So I'm going to recap just a bit. So what we've done to date is we put on the DNA, we put on the area that we want to work, We've checked with the BG3 pendulum on the uh, human archetypal points, which are the netters, which are the archetypes. We've identified that within the, uh, I think it's the BG3. And again, this, this is not, it's called the BGD3. Yeah. That within that area is where, within that archetypal energy is where the issue arises. And then what we need would need to do is go through each of these planes of existence. So the first would be the physical, the next would be uh, the vital, the emotional, the mental, the um, causal, and then the three higher spiritual. And once we identify which plane that works in, we would then move this ruler right that plane to that area and then that would now change the that would now change and the pendulum will now spin on that dot that wasn't spinning before so we now know that we've addressed that but within that um then this was this answer was in the vital body so there's something going on in the vital body that's calling causing a dissonance or a disease or whatever you want to call it you know a chaos within the within the energetics that need to be addressed now this is not a cure okay all you're doing is that you're it can it can it can provide relief you know but the idea is you don't want to rely on the ruler to be the answer you just want to use the ruler for temporary relief and aid while you're actually working on the issue yourself and you've identified that it could be in the vital body and that you're being now given relief in which you know and the person that we did this on they actually felt relief <laughs> our, our difference you know uh at uh, pretty immediately so once you once you actually identify the the area and you find you know and 
from this one, which is the general, you can actually break it down into a more specific area for each of those. So you can actually drill down to the best form. The, the, so within, say like within this, within the vital, you may find that there is uh, different, oh, I can't see it, but different levels and you'd find the exact form that is the best for your ailment at the time. And then once you do that, once you put on, you know, the the best solution for that, for right now I'm just going to use this same the same uh, issue here uh, we can then um, put on this thing which is just what they would call the trans um, tra transmitter so then you put this on the board in this this is the same location every time right here and now this board is actually generating BG3 to that area of the body of the person that you have on there. And what, what you would do then, you can verify it by taking the BG3 pendulum and putting it over the body area before you do this. You know, I mean, you take this down, you see if there's any BG3 in that area, and usually there's not. You put the board back together, you go over that body part, and the pendulum will begin to spin over the area, showing that the BG3 is being transmitted to that area. So you have this healing energy, this prana, this chi, this orgone being directed rather than to the whole body field, like we were talking about Giselle with like biofield tuning, where you may be doing the overall field, or with orgone, where you just have it, you know, over the whole field, you're actually concentrating and shooting this at a specific area or body part. And you're transmuting that energy, that beneficial BG3 energy to that. Any questions on what we've talked about to date on that? I guess I have an anecdote. Okay. Um, my mother, bless bless her heart and hopefully she's resting in peace mm -hmm. would use a button on a string mm -hmm. because she had digestive issues mm -hmm. she would hold it over food mm -hmm. to decide whether it was going to be good for her to, mm -hmm. to eat or not mm -hmm. and of course the whole family thought that she was a little bit weird but <laughs> this is uh that was a long time ago and and this is, of course, tied into that. And I don't know where she got her uh, her inclination to go there, but uh, well, that's that's yeah, all. I met a, a European gal um, at a clinic that used that technique for her food also. And a lot of people can do that. You can do that just with any neutral pendulum. It's better if you actually put your hand over the food or touch the food, because what you're then doing is you're actually seeing how that food, it's kind of like muscle testing. Right. So okay. if, if I was to grab this green juice and put, see, I mean, see that right there, how fast that's beginning to spin over this green juice in yeah. a clockwise direction. Very, very beneficial, right? So you can do that with just a neutral pendulum and see if it spins in a clockwise direction, it's beneficial. If it spins in a counterclockwise direction, it's detrimental. That's right. She would look at which direction it would yeah, spin. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, like I said, a very old technique, right? I mean, how old was your, I mean, how, how when was your mother born? She was born in 1916. Yeah. So, I mean, that's been, that's, that was pretty much common practice by a lot of people back in those eras, and that was all forgotten and lost. Uh, what, what was her nationality? Do you know or her culture? Uh, German. Okay. So, you know, she might have even learned some things from, you know, Steiner or whatever. Who knows? You know, picks up some of this stuff. Was she born here? Pardon me? Was she born in the U.S.? Uh, yes. She was okay. born in Glendale, Arizona. And were her parents here? Or were they from Germany? Her, no, not directly. Um, they were. They came out of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Um. She was the last of nine, so uh, her father passed before I was even 
born or thought of. But um, yeah, he was born at the end of the Civil War. So I have, I have a grandpa who was born at the end of the Civil War, <laughs> stretching out the generations of ways. So she learned it from somebody, I don't know if she learned from her family or not, but again, I'm, the idea is, is that these are very old techniques. They're nothing really new. It's just that we've been told that they don't work, but they, you know, they have been in practice for a long time. Yeah, I think she, she got it from an astrology, an astrologer friend of hers, who uh, yeah, I think it might have been where, where that came from. Any more questions about the biogeometry or and I, the reason I wanted to show this because it showed a lot of aspects of biogeometry rather than just a pendulum or something that actually showed a practical application. And this, to me, this is one of the most powerful tools within the biogeometry realm. Can I ask if scale matters? Like for example, these drawings are all quite small, mm -hmm. for example, in relation to the real um ratio of like the the actual body so would it matter what scale <clears throat> these geometries are created like no. is there an amplification with scale up or down not really i mean it's really more that once you because it's some of it's done with your intent right the practitioner's intent also so you're saying you know this is my intent this is what i mean they can be very very crude and very rudimentary also they don't have to be exact but you at least have to and it's funny because Dr. Gilbert actually talks about the cave paintings and that where you see the buffalo or whatever it is of the hunt on the cave walls. What he actually says is that the shaman would paint this buffalo, right, this very crude animal, and they would actually go and throw spears at the image on the wall to weaken the buffalo they were going to hunt. But through the image and through their intent, they were actually weakening that buffalo. And that's one of the reasons that they had the cave paintings. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. That's his story. But that's what he was actually saying is that that was that what was actually being done. That those weren't crude drawings because they couldn't draw better. They were just meant as a symbolic image of the buffalo itself. That would make sense. Any other questions regarding archetypal ruler? Or yes. Can I ask? Sorry, this is probably too specific. You know, you know the you know the the second um, strip with the circles where mm -hmm. um, where it was like different sizes of the mm -hmm. same thing. Why is it different sizes? So if scale is not uh, relevant, then it's more ratio. Why, why is it the, that's the ratio? It's the ratio of how much of that energy you're going to need, right? So this is, it's not that the, the size is different, it's the ratio and the curvature, right? So as you take this curvature back into that, that is kind of the idea of how much of that energy and to what proportion is, is required to actually um, benefit. And is there a way to record these other than with the drawings? Like, do, do you also, um, <clears throat> is there a numerical kind of equivalent to some of these geometries? In terms of the- Like for their energy, for their energy. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I mean, within, it's tough. It's more of that you, you either, within biogeometry, you're either using form, angle, or number, right? And I'm sure there's correspondence between form, angle, and number for each of these, but it's kind of like you choose which way do you want to go. Do you want to use number? Do you want to use angle? Do you want to use form, right? And each one uh, can be implemented within its own structure. Like a lot of times they use like a modified 45 degree angle. I think it might have some here. So within biogeometry, if you place this on a negative energy line on the ground, and this is all that's really needed to transmute that energy. Can you guys see this kind of angle here that's modified? So it's a, it's a 90 degree angle with this curve in it. And this is a very powerful form within biogeometry to transmute. You can put two of these on your phone 
this angle and it supposedly transmutes the uh, de de detrimental energy of the 5G into a beneficial or neutral. And that's what's required. And that's done with angle. So, you know, is there a correspondence? I don't know if there's a direct correspondence between angle and shape. But this is, you know, this is a 90 degree angle, so you're doing both angle and shape, right? Mm -hmm. And each angle, and within the biogeometry, each angle has, and oftentimes that's what they believe is the detrimental qualities of some of the Earth energy lines, is that you have our grid lines, our natural grid lines, but underneath those grid lines, you may have water veins or something that cross these grids at certain angles. And those angles is what rather determines whether or not it's a power spot or it's a negative energy or so on. Any I'm other? thinking, I'm thinking, you know, I was telling that to a friend yesterday, uh, you know, because I was listening to Dr. Lando when he talked about the Hebrew language. Yes. And he says he's studying that. And then uh, he does studied as well. Uh, Hawaiian language. Yes. So then I said to my friend in the Bible, it said, okay, uh, when they were trying to stone this woman mm -hmm. and they, the Christ came and he made, he made with a stick, he made a sign on the ground. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just saying that knowledge is there. Mm -hmm. we, we could learn it. Like, um, it's like the mudras that we saw on, the, on AV, you know, like if we make certain well, of our shape with our hands or mm -hmm. so I just keep looking at this thinking, uh, wow, there's so much, eh? Well, that's funny because Isaac was talking to Bear yesterday about mudras and Bear pulls out this book. With how, how many mudras were in that book? Hundreds. <laughs> it's hundreds of mudras that, that, that Bear was showing him. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we are very powerful beings and we have a lot of technology at our disposal that is free and that is based on our form and our shape and, and our, and what, what we can do. And I think that this is the new spiritual science that's going to come in to the world and that we are actually going to be part of uh, bringing that forward again. Can I ask another question? Sure, that's what you're here for. That's why we, that's why we have your friendly day today. <laughs> I know. <Hey>. Or you. <laughs> well, you know, it's her birthday yesterday. Yeah, happy birthday. Oh, yeah, remember? So yeah. it was the 29th because the, my birthday was the 29th mm -hmm. because we were originally going to have this call yesterday, but mm -hmm. then we changed it to mm -hmm. today. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, the question I have is, you said at the beginning that um, you normally apply the color side of it mm -hmm. last. Mm -hmm. Can you just maybe talk us through, like, after you've done this, like, you know, does anything else happen, you know, between this stage and working with the color side of things and, and how, you know, and how do you apply the color? <laughs> well, I, I think I'll do the color because it's more of a, That'd be a whole other system, but we can do that for the second uh, Europe friendly day. But usually with Good. what I do with this method, because, you know, you need to keep the board set up to actually generate the power. But what I found is that if you actually take a photograph of the board and print it out on a color, you know, like a glossy or whatever, that that will actually transmute and retain the image because you've captured the vibrational energy in the photograph. So if you take a photo of this, print it out, you can actually capture that energetic level within that. So that's where kind of where the power of the photograph goes. Um, I'll get in, like I said, to talk about the whole color and how to balance and that. That's a, a, a rather lengthy, you know, conversation or, or display. So we can talk. That will be the second Earth uh, European Friendly Day. We'll talk a little bit about color and color balancing. Um, but with this, this is you at this point this is really just for the human body this is very specific this isn't for an area or a room you can do that but what if you were going to do that you might want to put the shape of the room on here and so on and so forth to actually look at the energetic qualities of that room okay any other questions before yeah. we close here 
Hopefully you I enjoy like that it. Green drink. I like that green drink. Looks very uh, <laughs> holiday. <laughs> holiday. Yeah, now you need some red, like cranberry yeah. or something. Yes, well, I can <laughs> bring something in. So anyway, well, I'm going to stop recording now. So then we can talk a little bit. Uh, just hopefully that will help some people. But uh, 